morning, my friends. I am so glad to see y'all. You know, it, it, every week that goes by, I just, I, I don't know, I just keep getting more and more excited about what God's doing here at the church. Y'all should see some of the messages that we get online from people that have either seen our sermons, our music, uh, music services, or they've seen, we've made these little ads, okay? And they're just like three minutes long, but it's kind of like a condensed version of our service. And I put one out the other day, and I'm telling you, so many people shared it, and we got tons of messages from people who are saying, well, what type of church are you? You know, I, I would like to come visit. What are your times? I mean, for me, that's such an encouraging thing that we're doing something right. And one of the things that I expound on in the ad, I'm going to make another one today, is you guys. Okay? It's not, trust me, my sermons aren't that exciting. Okay? But you know what gets people in this door and makes them stay? It's you. It is the members of this church that are so loving, so kind, so welcoming. I'm telling you, I've been in all sorts of churches. When I was singing gospel music, we were all over the United States. Five days of the week, I was in a different church every night. Sometimes it would be in Florida, sometimes it would be in Virginia, Maine, Michigan. It was all over the place. This is my church home. And I've told, I told Ken that from the very first moment of me being here. This felt like home. This felt like family because every single person here ain't nobody putting on show. Amen? Amen. This is a bunch of real people living real life and worshiping a real God. Amen? Amen. Woo. None of that was scripted, y'all, so I need, I need to get on my manuscript. <laughs> Look, I, I hope you have a great week. We're at the end of chapter 4 of Galatians. And look, if you got a uh, pamphlet this morning, Katie's going to be mad at you, but she's not in here right now. She's in children's church, so she can't hit me too hard. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell her. I, Don, you just got back. You can't hey, tell I her. got to catch up. Uh -huh, you right. <laughs> I added some verses, and you know what I decided? Let's go ahead and finish the rest of chapter 4 here. So we're going to do verses 21 through 31. And Paul today, he creates this, this analogy, this allegory for the Galatians to explain how they are not sons of slavery, but they are sons of promise. Paul uses the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael as an example. Look, let's stand together and read today's passage. I'll read it quick since it's 10 verses. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Verse 28, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are the children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. You may be seated this morning. Look, there's a, there's a lot to scratch our heads at. There's lots of history, there's lots of Jewish culture, and loads of ancient context. Now, before we start going verse to verse, I want to share, talk about sons of freedom and of promise. I want to 
want to share with you um, this letter that a son wrote to his dad. Dear Dad, it's with a heavy heart that I write this letter. I decided to elope with my new girlfriend, Tamara. We wanted to avoid a scene with you and Mom. I found a real passion with Tamara, and she's so lovely. Even with her face piercings, her cool skull tattoos, and her tight motorcycle clothes. But it's not the only joy to have. She's pregnant. <laughs> Tamara said that we will be very happy, even though you won't care for her because she is much older than me. But she already owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood that will last us all winter long. She wants to have many more children with me, and that's become one of my dreams, too. Tamara taught me how cool drugs are, and we'll be making lots of it and trading it with her friends to buy groceries and diapers. In the meantime, we'll pray that the doctors can find out how to cure Tamara's life's problem. She's had to shave her head twice already. Don't worry, Dad. I'm 17 and a half years old. And I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure we'll come back to visit so that you can get to know all of your grandchildren. Your ever-loving son, Eddie. P.S. Don't worry, Dad. None of the above is true. I'm over at Kyle's house next door. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than my report card on the kitchen table. <laughs> I love you. And call me when it's safe to come home. <laughs> it sounds like this son took a little bit too much freedom and promise, am I right? You know, growing up, my parents, uh, they actually gave me quite a lot of freedom. But I tried to follow the rules as best I could because I knew what the punishment would be when I got home. Being the son of two very active members of the community was a blessing and a curse. Everybody knew my mom and dad, and they would report my comings and goings to them. And it didn't help that my dad was a pastor and a detective. I couldn't get away with anything. He's like, he would always tell me, I got eyes everywhere, son. I know, and the Lord knows. My poor kids, look, they don't even know what's in store for them whenever they become teenagers. But look, let's jump into these verses real quick and see what Paul has to say. Verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? He's saying, okay, all you folks want so bad to have everyone follow the law for their salvation. Do you even read it? Do you even know it? I grew up in a, a very old school, very conservative area, and I grew up in a very old school, conservative church. I remember when I was an older kid, maybe around Harper's age, Harper's eight, so I might have been nine or ten, I, I began to ask questions. But I usually, you would think that would be a good thing. You want your kids to ask questions. Am I right, Cassie and Jake? Yeah, you, you want them to ask questions. The problem is, is I always ask the wrong questions. Most of the people in my life were church people. You know, not all of them were from my church, but in our community, just about everybody attended one church or another. Now, some of the rules were different based off of which church they went to. And, and I was a big fan of reading the encyclopedias that we had, the Encyclopedia Britannica. My mom and dad, I don't even know how this happened, but there was a salesman, and this shows you how quickly the world changes, right? When I was a little kid, there was an Encyclopedia Britannica salesman that came to our house on James Road in Virgo, Louisiana. He must have been lost and decided I was gonna make a sale anyway. Well, I remember my mom and dad bought that whole set, and I would just sit there and read these encyclopedias. Now, if you have any question in your mind whether your pastor was a nerd, 
That just answered it for me. <laughs> As a kid, I would sit inside. I lived, I mean, lived on a farm. There was 150 acres I could have explored. I was inside reading the encyclopedia. Lord, my mother was so proud. My father? Well, he's proud of me now. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I began reading about religions all over the world. And even at a, a relatively young age, I remember asking, asking my Sunday school teacher this question. And you've probably heard me mention this before. I said, if we can't wear hats inside the church, how come Jews wear hats all the time in church? And I, re I remember this as clear as a bell. He looked at me, and there was this long pause. And he said, well... Them Jews don't read the part of the Bible with Jesus in. Jesus don't like ball caps in church. <laughs> but you and I both know that Jesus never mentioned ball caps in the New Testament. And it wasn't until I was older that I realized a lot of this church stuff that we do, it isn't even in the Bible. Paul is kind of making the same point to the Galatians there. He said, do you even know What's in the very thing that you want people to follow? Now, he's talking to these Judaizers, right? They want these people to follow the law. But here, let me talk to you. Again, here's my recommendation. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe in God, if you call yourself a Christian, get a Bible and read it. I don't care how much you read it. Just read it a little bit a day. I'm telling you, it will make a huge difference. Let's look at the meat of this passage, verse 22 and 23. And he's saying, you didn't even know, you don't even know what's in the law. And here's what he says. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Verse 23, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, to give you a real quick Bible history lesson, Abraham, right, he is the patriarch. He's the great, 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 great grandfather of the Jewish people. It was with him that God made the promise that would bring about Jesus. God also made a promise to Abraham that he would have a son. Now, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were very old. I mean, we're talking 80, 90 years old. Because Abraham and Sarah were so old, they thought it would be impossible for them to have a child. So Sarah, in her infinite wisdom, decides to allow Abraham to have a child with her servant, Hagar. Now look, y'all might appreciate this, and I may get in trouble for saying this. Melanie and I, were, I was telling her about all this, and we, she, she, I'm telling you. Y'all pray for my wife because she's sitting in the bedroom doing her homework. She's in grad school right now and she's trying to write her papers and stuff. And I bust in there and I'm like, you're never going to believe. Look right here. This says this about this. Man, look at these verses. And we were talking about Sarah allowing Abraham to have a child with her servant. And I said, Sarah was a real smart one, huh? I said, look, I said, you win it. Making these decisions, I said, these guys in the Bible, when their wives say this, they're just like, oh, oh, okay. They don't even question. I said, look at Adam and Eve. Eve eats the apple. Adam, she's like, you want a bite? Adam's, oh, okay. And she said that, well, you know, maybe that's why us women have a hard time picking which restaurant we want to go to. We don't want to repeat history of making a bad choice. <laughs> Tell me. Again, pray for my wife because she has to deal with me. <laughs> Look, Hagar gave birth to a son named Ishmael. Now, God is looking at them and going, what are you doing? I made you a promise that I would give you a son. You're trying to go through a loophole here. You, had, you weren't patient. But afterwards, God makes good on his promise. And he gives Abraham and Sarah Isaac. Now look, there's a whole lot more 
good, good stuff to go with that story of Abraham. But for our intents and purposes, the main info that you need to know today is that one son was born of a slave, and the other son was born the son of inheritance, the son of promise. Abraham couldn't rightfully give his inheritance to an illegitimate son. So let's look at verse 24 and 25. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery. With her, two, with her children. These two women, and ultimately their sons, they're like the law and the promise of Jesus. The verse says that Hagar, the servant girl, is like Mount Sinai. Now, if you don't know Mount Sinai, that's the very mountain that God gave Moses the law. But that law, as Paul has stated earlier in the book of Galatians, it's like slavery. You were bound to it. You were imprisoned by it, he says early. And of course, you were enslaved to it. You can't make any decision against it. You have to follow it perfectly and be blameless. But none of us are, right? Verses 26 and 27. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Paul quotes this passage from Isaiah 54, where the prophet, he, the prophet Isaiah, he's given this blessing on Zion, on Israel. But in a way, this blessing applies to all the children of promise. That's, that's us, y'all. We're the children of promise. We are the descendants of Abraham through who? Jesus. Look, I'm, I'm going to do this real quickly. I'm going to read through Isaiah 54. Because look, if this, if this passage does not make you want to get up and go tell everybody in the world about Jesus, I don't know what will. I'm going to read Isaiah 54. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song. Shout for joy, you, were never who, you who were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. God is saying, make a home. Make a home, because I'm going to be there for you. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid, for you will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandon you. But with deep compassion, I bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Afflicted city, lashed by storms and not comforted, I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise 
Your foundations will be lapis lazuli. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. In righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed from you. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. See, it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals in the flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail. You will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is is their vindication from me. God is saying, I am on your side. I am on your side. Nothing that comes against you will be able to take you down. Paul is quoting from this. This is one of the most inspirational prophecies that you can come by. God said, Jews, you messed up. Children of Israel, you messed up. I let you go and do your own thing. I let you go off into exile. But if you stick by my side, I will do amazing things for you. For Abraham and Sarah, they couldn't bear children. Or at least they thought they could. But God says, I will make a way when there is no way. And what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. None come to the Father but by me. Y'all, let's look at verse 28. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. We are children of promise. We are no longer under the law. We have the gift of the Son of God. He came to die for our sins. To give us a remedy for this disease of sin. Just as there was this fight between Isaac and Ishmael, the son of promise and the son of slavery, there is a fight happening right now with the Galatians between the sons of promise and the sons of slavery under the law. Look, these Judaizers that are saying, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to keep up with these laws. If you believe in Jesus and follow him, that's not enough. You have to come to my church. You should look like my expectations of a Christian. You have to follow my set of rules as to what a Christian should look like. You notice, just like these Judaizers then, and the people that say the same stuff now, you never hear these people say, you should follow the word, or you should follow God. <coughs> you never hear them say, you should go to a church that preaches the word. You should be around people that believe in the word. You should go and spread the word. No, you don't hear people saying that. Because sometimes, look, these churches... And I'm sure you can think of a few. They like to make up their own rules that aren't even in the Word. I know, I'm, look, I know I'm not speaking to a single soul that's sitting in this building. But maybe somebody's watching online. Or maybe you know someone that's like these Judaizers. That's self-righteous. Like these folks in Paul's day. 
And let me say clearly, again, not talking to anybody in this building, but let me look directly at this camera. If you're one of those haughty Christians that likes to prance around and talk about how devoted and how righteous you are, this ain't the church for you. This ain't the church for you. The people in this room and the man that's standing behind this pulpit, we're all sinners. We mess up daily. The only claim to righteousness that any of us have is the death and the resurrection of the Son of God, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And all we're trying to do is get one step closer to him every day. Amen. 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 Verse 31. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. My friend, my, my family, we are not descendants of slavery. We are descendants of freedom. We are children of promise. That promise is the saving power of Jesus. <sighs> all your sins, all your mistakes, he came to wipe them away. If you don't know him today, if you don't know how, oh, you all, how wonderful it is to serve him, you come and talk to him. Look, y'all, I said it at the very beginning yesterday, we had a funeral for one of my most beloved students. There must have been a dozen people that got up to speak. She was 20 years old. Every person that got up said the same thing. That she had a joy. She had a joy that was beyond this world. It's like the Lord just put the spirit on her and every person that she came in contact with, she would tell them about her faith. She lived her faith out unapologetically. She let everybody know that she served Jesus. And I think to myself at 20 years old, I hope one day whenever I grow up, that I am as excited as that young lady was. Here's my challenge to you. There's a world of people out there that don't know this Jesus. Find him. And you tell them how good he is. You tell them how he's blessed you. How he's blessed your family. How even through all of your struggles, all of your trials, every bad thing that happens, he's right there with you. He gives you peace and he gives you comfort. Go tell somebody this week. Y'all stand with me. Lord, we love you so much. God, you, you, it, it's hard to actually put into words how wonderful it is to serve you and how, God, you can make the difference in the way we think, in the way we react to things. And God, in, in our daily actions, you make the difference. God, if you're just sitting there saying, come to me, come to me. God, I, I pray for this church, God, and, and, and here's my specific prayer, God. Make us a banner. Make us people that go out and tell people about you. God, our name is Live Oak. We need to be alive and we need to grow. God, I ask you put that blessing on us, God, that we go out into this world and we bring life to others. God, we can't keep it trapped in these four walls. You are so good. Every praise, every word, every song that's been sung, God, it is all for you. Not for one of us, but all for you. And God, we are thankful for the kindness, the love, and the redemption that you give to us. 
be with us. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also you. Love you, my friend.